Um, thanks everybody for attending. Um, you're here with Cropster for our webinar series. And our topic today is finding the perfect green coffee storage conditions. And this is a subject that we were really keen to um, pursue following up on some research that Christoph Baravoz from Hard Beans has been pursuing. And we also wanted to make sure that we add a lively discussion. So we've got Stuart Ritson, who's a coffee consultant with a lot of experience in, in green coffee and working um, in the coffee trade and with various roasters to also add a, a point to this discussion here. And I'll be your host or your moderator. I'm Marcus Young with Cropster. Um, and I come to this discussion also having worked as a roaster and worked as a coffee trader and also worked with producers in East Africa. So I'm really excited and interested in this topic. Um, I wanna give Chris and Stuart a chance to say hello and briefly introduce themselves before we really jump into the topic. So Chris, why don't you take it away for us? Uh, hello everyone, my name is Chris uh, and I'm the head of coffee at Hard Beans Coffee Roasters. Uh, we are kind of fresh roastery on the market, but uh, very focused on research, and finding new knowledge about coffee. And one of those uh, projects was the green coffee storage, where we were searching for the best solution, how to keep and preserve the quality of green coffee. So that's it. And uh, more to come in the next uh, slides. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. And Stuart, how about yourself? Yeah. My name is Stuart. I'm uh, based in Groningen in the north of the Netherlands, originally British. Um, I work as a coffee consultant and also uh, I manage sales for Aceto, a small coffee importer in the UK and EU. Um, yeah, I've been working as a barista in different sales roles, running cafes, as well as working, doing a little production work roasting and, and other things like that over the last 10 years. Um, for the last five years in particular, though, I've been more focused on green coffee. So I worked with Cafe Imports for about three and a half years in the Germany office. Um, and as I said, now I'm, I'm still in the green trade, helping people find coffees. That's uh, my consultancy is often revolved around finding weird coffee. Um, so if you ever want any tips on where to get Mount Everest beans, this is something I had to look into. Uh, but uh, yeah, so, and um, yeah, hopefully I'll be able to bring uh, some other perspectives to this discussion and answer some different questions as well, based on my experiences working with roasters and traveling the world, seeing roasteries. Great, great. Thanks guys. And um, it's great. I'm just, I'm just monitoring the chat as we talk and there's already questions coming in. So clearly we have a topic that's of great interest to to our attendees, it's fantastic. Awesome. Great, great. And, um, you know, as far as what, you know, Cropster and our interest in, in hosting a webinar like this um, and, and continuing this discussion, I think you know, we provide a, a platform that really is, can be kind of the nucleus of a coffee company where you know it's it's about tracking roast profiles, but it's so much more than that with our tools that we'll discuss in a little bit, like Cropster's ambient sensor that can help you track environmental conditions surrounding your coffee and your roastery, um, the ability of Cropster Cup and the Cropster quality modules to, to sync up to roast profiles, to green coffee, to green coffee over time. Um, I'm really excited to um, to learn more about Chris's research and and just kind of be thinking about how the tools that Cropster has can can provide even further insight into the work that that he's doing. So, you know, Cropster has a lot of tools that, well, um, they weren't specifically part of this research, but they work really well in conjunction with what you're, what you and Hard Beans are studying. And Chris, can you give us just a little bit of an overview of your research before we jump into like a video tour of your facility and some things? And who uh, your partners yes. were with us? Okay, uh, so 
when we started our roster, we had beans coffee roasters. We were searching for the perfect storage conditions for specialty coffee grade coffees. And uh, we didn't find any like uh, very scientific uh, knowledge behind that. So we decided to write a big uh, project and uh, build uh, a very uh, laboratory warehouse storage room with included with four more chambers uh, where we could measure like and check different coffees. Uh, so we decided to build a main warehouse and a chamber with minus 10 degrees Celsius, plus five degrees Celsius, plus 10 degrees Celsius, plus 20, 20 degrees Celsius. And the last uh, topic, last uh, storage room was like next to the roaster. Because in many cases, when you see a roastery, especially a small one, uh, coffee bags are laying down on the pallets uh, next to the machine or uh, on the, in the same room where you roast your coffees. And the aim was to find the best solutions, uh, how to keep the coffee, how to preserve the quality um, for two coffees. Uh, back in the days, uh, it was uh, both coffees were from Guatemala from Huehuetenango, uh, from two farms, Finca El Oregano and Finca La Maravilla. Uh, both coffees uh, were Catura varietals. One was natural and the second one was washed. And uh, we placed those coffees into small grain pro bags, uh, so the foil bags, and also in youth bags. Every month, a sample of green and sample of roasted coffee was taken out from the chamber into the main warehouse. Uh, to stabilize uh, the temperature and then uh, roast it using small uh, roost sample roaster with the same uh, repeatable uh, profile. And afterwards, uh, roasted and green samples were sent to two laboratories. Uh, since 2018, we are working with uh, Institute of Heavy Organic Synthesis and laboratory yards. Uh, those two laboratories on a daily basis, over 20 people are uh, working on coffee for us, measuring volatile compounds, measuring chlorogenic acids, measuring uh, fatty acids and everything what you will see later on. Also every three months since 2018, the next one will be on Tuesday next week. Uh, we are organizing the cupping, so sensory summits uh, where we involved a few Polish curators uh, and we are evaluating the coffees. So just for your uh, future knowledge, uh, we don't know which coffee we cup uh, or what coffee we cup. So each cupping every three months is a double blind, triple coded cupping. Uh, so for 15 months, we did the first research for 15 months, we didn't knew what's exactly in the cup uh, from like which storage room or what type of packagings. We knew that it's like washed coffee because you can feel it and taste it. Uh, same with naturals, but uh, we didn't knew the number of chambers. So always there is a third party person who's uh, responsible for setting the cupping table um, that we as judges don't know what's inside the cup. And December 2020 was the month where we finished the main part of the storage project uh, and we gathered all, uh, no, almost all knowledge we got, all data, and we converted that into first uh, scientific article, which is available in open source, so everyone can read it, reach it at the research gate. Uh, and there will be a few more, of course, because the like amount of knowledge we gathered from the research is uh, way bigger than we expected. Our goal was to prove that freezing green coffee is the best, but in the end, it's not. Um, that's good for a, for a like economical part of leading and, um, and having such warehouse at your roastery. So that's a small overview. Of course, the project is still going on because I decided to add additional measurement, additional experiment. Uh, I took very fresh coffee. So the same coffees from the same farm, from Finca 
El Oregano and Finca La Maravilla from Huehuetenango in Guatemala. But this time uh, I uh, managed to bring the samples directly from the um, drying beds, from the patios. Uh, and we want to measure how the coffee is like behaving in the first month. Because last time, since the, like, uh, it took like four or five months from uh, harvest to shipment to Opole. So it was a lot of long time. And this time I decided to take the coffee straight out of the patios shipped by plane. It was vacuum packed. And uh, now we are measuring only three storage rooms, seven degrees Celsius, 10 degrees Celsius, and 13 degrees Celsius, and three storage uh, packages. So like a youth bag, grain pro bag and vacuum pack. And this um, experiment will be led until September, 2021. And in October, I want to like uh, gather all the data from fresh Great. coffee, from the older one and in all storage conditions. Great. Well, let's um let's take a look at your facility. I already have, I've been just jotting some notes down and have questions coming up already, but I want to I want okay. you to walk us through the facility that you've put together here. Um, so I'm just going to load up that video that you shared, and I look forward to hearing um, hearing more as we as we see your operation. And I will start the video now. Yeah, so that's the short uh, video of our main warehouse. Uh, the main warehouse capacity is 15 tons of coffee, and the main warehouse is like triple layer walls. Uh, right in the front of the main warehouse, we have the uh, roasting room, also with uh, air condition and everything measured with crop stir uh, ambient sensors. Uh, those are the small chambers, for example, 10 degrees Celsius, uh, where we have shelves. And on the shelves, we have coffee samples. Uh, coffee samples in grain pro bags, in youth bags, and in vacuum pack in the newest uh, version of the project. So each uh, samples every month are taken from the storage room, from the chamber. And like I said before, uh, we are using a REST sample roster uh, with a po power profile, not uh, environmental line profile. It's the power profile uh, to implement and input uh, each time the same amount of energy. That's why I decided to work with REST. Uh, instead of gas uh, sample roster or other one, uh, because here I had the um, like certainty that that it will be repeatable. And afterwards, everything is uh, packed in uh, regular zip bags. And on the same day, all samples, green and roasted samples, are shipped by us uh, to the laboratories. So we are not using carriers. Uh, we are using our own transportation uh, to go to the lab, uh, and then they are prepared in the lab uh, to start the measurements. Because also in the laboratories we are working, uh, they have the same storage chambers. So they have like minus 10, plus 5, plus 10, plus 18, plus 20 back in the days. And uh, they were keeping the coffee on, in the same stable conditions. So. Uh, it was really important for us to, um, to maintain it stable. Um, the, the next slide you can see, um, that's, those are the results after uh, 12 months of, uh, sorry, after 15 months of cuttings. So um, you can see types of bags and types of uh, processing methods. It's grain pro washed, grain pro natural, youth washed and youth natural. And what you can see that the highest scoring coffees uh, were both from five and 10 degrees Celsius chamber. Uh, but overall, the highest scores in total, we, what's, uh, what could be very shock for you, uh, we got from uh, coffee from 10 degrees Celsius chamber, which was packed in youth bag. And that's something which was double confirmed. So it was youth bag one on the 12th month and on the 15th month. So our um, conclusion for that 
uh, but it needs to be proven again, is that uh, if you maintain stable conditions, uh, stable airflow, stable uh, humidity and temperature, uh, there is no matter if you keep it in a grain pro or a youth pack. Youth pack is performing the same, so high quality. And you can see a very big drop with the chamber at 20 degrees Celsius. And this chamber, 20 degrees Celsius plus, was the fastest down, um, like down uh, scoring chamber after three months. Uh, after we put the coffees into the storage room, uh, the lost in points was like around four on the SEA capping protocol, which is a lot. And it's amazing uh, that's, to compare that that um, 20 degree chart, yeah. which is the gray, the gray. Um, graphing yes. to the uncontrolled conditions, right? The uncontrolled actually performed better. Yeah, because um, just to just to like uh, give you the knowledge, uh, uncontrolled conditions at, on the very first month of storage, uh, it was colder than twenty, uh, because it was like autumn and winter time in Poland. So outside the building was like minus five, zero plus five. So inside the storage room, like in the uncontrolled conditions, we had like around 14. That's why it's like, it was performed a little bit better. Uh, but uh, the main uh, arguments after this big research is that the best scoring coffees were not from minus 10, but from plus five, plus 10. And the biggest, shop in the quality was in the chamber 20 degrees celsius and as many of you knows and many not but uh, most of the storage and main warehouses uh, are set to around 20 22 um, even more and as you can see no matter if you keep it in grain pro back or if you keep it in a youth pack and probably no matter if you keep it even in a vacuum pack uh, the temperature increase is uh, degrading the coffee. Right, and Chris, there's a there's a question here from one of our attendees about um the chart. There's 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 two bars for each, each temperature. Does that represent the beginning of the study versus twelve months later, or no? That's uh, for the last month. Uh, so the, the 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 chart you can see it's the month number fifteen. And the first and uh, second um, line is uh, double blind because each coffee was twice on a cupping table. So okay. it's the first, like first assessment on the cupping table and second assessment on the cupping table. Okay, so it's just the time difference. Or... It's like, it's the same coffee from the same storage room, but on the cupping table, it appears twice. Oh, okay. Okay. Double blind cutting. Okay, great. So, gotcha. Great. And um, here's just a few a few photos from that video of the the storage chambers. These were the smaller, sort of more lab based chambers, correct? Yeah. Yes. Each chamber is one meter to one meter, so it's like one square meter, um, like uh, on the footprint. And each one is fully controlled. So we have uh, on the left side 20 degrees Celsius, then from the left side 10 degrees Celsius, then we with the steel floor that's minus 10. And the last one was five degrees Celsius. Each chamber was uh, fully controlled and each chamber, the uh, data from the chamber was uh, stored into and locked in the internet for 24 hours a day. So okay. we have like, thousands of pages of red logs, uh, how it was like jumping. That's the op opposite side. Uh, so you can see that just the floor is concrete, uh, but we made that on purpose. And walls, roof uh, are three layer, like uh, three layer walls and three layer uh, roof to, to have the, a certainty that uh, the energy will not be leaving the uh, chamber uh, during uh, summer or winter time. 
and uh, we have air circulation. So the air circulation is around three capacities of storage room per hour of fresh, fresh ionized air. Uh, we wanted to be sure that there is no bacteria, no microbes inside. So uh, and this, this is your 15 ton storage room? Yeah, you can easily fit 15. On the screen, uh, that's 12 tons. Okay. So, and, and now since January, because Cropster Ambient Sensor Project is a new project, and we were invited by uh, Jonas uh, to join uh, Cropster because we are working since beginning with Cropster, which is, I think, the best solution for logging all roasting data. Uh, we implemented the uh, Cropster Ambient sensor Sensors. Currently, we have uh, five sen sensors which are on. Uh, one is in the main warehouse. Se second one is the chamber seven degrees Celsius. Third one is uh, next to the uh, to the control panel at the Dietrich roaster. Fourth one is uh, at the back of the roaster. And the last one is in office. Uh, and that's how we are maintaining the uh, storage nowadays. Fantastic. And, um, and, and looking at these photos, it's quite different from kind of typical storage conditions. These are just some photos I had from, um, from a producer in Rwanda loading a container out of their warehouse um, and kind of just a typical green, green coffee storage situation in that warehouse that, as Chris said, might be kept at right around 20 degrees. So Stuart, I'm, as you're sitting here watching this and seeing these photos, and as someone who's probably spent time in plenty of warehouses like this, <laughs> um, how do you compare this to what you typically see and how would you describe typical conditions and maybe some of the concerns you've had? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's, there's obviously two layers to this and one of the um, attendees mentioned this, you know, like how can we do this better um, in a producing country? Um, but speaking first to the roastery and warehouse setup, I mean, the picture in front of us is pretty typical for most warehouses, uh, maybe not so much of one lot, um, but essentially a big open space with coffee in it and concrete floors is about all you can expect from most warehouses, whether you're in, in um, a producing country or, or in Western Europe or the US. Um, I've seen a handful of, of warehouses with more temperature controls um interestingly though uh one of them one of the famous one here in europe i just found out has exactly 20 degrees well 19 degrees celsius uh, ambient temperature maintained the whole time which uh, maybe is not the best thing now um and also i heard i read recently in a report from sukafina that they um, are planning in their own warehouses to turn off the ac because they found that the, the coffee actually didn't cup any better in a in an AC environment versus not, and it's obviously a lot of energy, and they're trying to to do the world some favors there. Um, but yeah, warehouses it's pretty normal to see this. Uh, roasters it it varies quite massively. Um, I think I would say my experience of roasters storage spaces is that they're very much more. It is about practicalities and where there is temperature stability, for instance, air conditioning units in quiet separate rooms. Um, it's more of a conditioning thing than a storage thing. Uh, ultimately, a lot of roasters run into the cash flow issues of sure they could pick up this 50 bags, this 100 bags and put it somewhere, but actually they can't because they can't afford to buy all that coffee all in one go. So I see it much more typical that where there is any degree of control, it is um, a small amount and it's really there to mitigate against uh, hot weather, sudden changes in weather effectively. You know, if it gets really wintry over the weekend or really summery, um, you find your roast curves are way off. I mean, I'm sure plenty of people on the call have had this experience. So yeah, I think the, the things we're seeing, even it's quite a testament to Christoph's um, commitment to to his green quality that even your storage room basic storage room is like triple lined walls and sealed off and all these things because yeah i, I think i know very few roasters who, who are able to do that 
um, or who have make, made the choice to, to do that kind of thing. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, and no, I think that's really interesting. We, we talked a little bit and I'll ask Christoph to share maybe in a little bit about like the cost of implementing this, but Stuart, thank you for bringing to light also just the cost of holding 15 tons of inventory is out of, um, is, is perhaps out of the reach of many of the roasters that we all work with. Or they um, believe it's out of that reach. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. No, that's great. And you know, so, so one of these storage conditions, of course, that um, that we've been talking about is really around temperature. But as Chris also mentioned, um, he is also managing for packaging type, and you know, thinking about you know Grain Pro versus Jute bags. Um, I love these these small sealed grain pro bags from your, from your study, but maybe you can talk a little bit about um, just kind of another look at the data, but you know, more specifically about what you were finding with the jute storage conditions versus the, the, the grain pro and at different temperatures for different coffee types. And, and most of the cases, uh, grain pro is performing way better. So there are not so many fluctuation in terms of, uh, of points. Uh, so like we can say that, that with Grain Pro, it's more stable, but still we can see the changes uh, between temperature. Uh, so on the lines on the, on the screen here, number one, number two, et cetera, until number six, those are the months we were cupping the, the coffee. So uh, number one was, uh, the coffee entering the, cha the chamber. So that's why it was highest score, 86.75 from what I remember. Number two was three months later. Number three was six months later. Number four was nine months later. Number five was 12 months later. And number six was 15 months later. Mm -hmm. And I like you can see um, the close, the smallest gap between scores and the highest scores score on the at the end of the project was in the chamber number 10. So chamber with 10 degrees Celsius plus. And the biggest jumps we can see on the uh, 20 degrees Celsius. And also uh, five degrees Celsius was dancing. That's something what we found uh, during the uh, project that uh, the chambers, all chambers, uh, have kind of tolerancy uh, and they work plus minus one degree Celsius. And in four degrees Celsius plus, uh, the density of water is changing. And those changes uh, with four degrees Celsius of density can influence the taste and how the coffee will uh, act on the cupping table. Uh, that's why uh, that's why now the newest part of the project uh, contains seven degrees Celsius, 10 degrees Celsius and 13 degrees Celsius to avoid those density, water density changes. Uh, and like you can see here, that's a youth pack a natural process. And we don't see huge drops in terms of quality in 10 degrees Celsius. Uh, even in five, uh, you can see that both after three months, after six months, the score is almost the same. Uh, so as long as you preserve the quality, the score is the same. So um, it's super important, uh, even to have like, a, like even for those best lots you got, uh, to create a small chamber, a small fridge, small room, which is not so expensive, like, building such like 15 ton facility uh, to preserve the quality. Because in many cases, uh, we as a specialty coffee roasteries, we are working directly with producers buying expensive coffees and keeping it for months at the roastery, especially like last year was the proof of that. Uh, 2020 was the year that we didn't know, knew how much coffee we shall, shall buy because we didn't know if the coffee shops will be open, if our customers will be buying the coffees or not. And um, 
preserving the, 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 the stability of our warehouse, uh, we can also preserve the uh, shelf quality of the bean and also chemical compounds. I didn't implement those numbers. You can read that in the article at ResearchGate, but you can also check uh, the, the chlorogenic acids, uh, the antioxidants, how it's changing uh, depending on how we keep the coffee. And especially on this graph now, uh, you can see that uh, even if we keep the coffee in grain pro natural bag, uh, in the grain pro bag and it was natural coffee, uh, the jump in uh, 20 degrees Celsius down was quite uh, significant. And uh, we pay a lot for the coffee and we offer our customers and we say, like in many cases, roasteries are writing scores on the packages. And they say, oh, our coffee is 86. But when the scoring was done, uh, it was like at the origin, it was like at the arrival, or it's uh, through the time. So I think it's very valuable. And the reason for the project was like just to set up for us the best storage conditions. Um, and we can see uh, after almost three years of research that uh, there was a sense to, to let this project on. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a question here um, from one of our attendees about any information on the drying of the coffee. And I think there was some surprise at some of these samples losing as much as four points after just three months. So, I mean, I know you have HPLC and analysis of all the chemical compounds, but yeah. as you were pulling samples and taking moisture readings and things, were you also seeing stability or changes there or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you can see like every time we, we took out the coffee sample from the chamber, it was like the process was that one day, so 24 hours before uh, roasting it, every sample was placed in the main storage room in 18 degrees Celsius. Uh, afterwards, before roasting, we were measuring the water activity and moisture content. And the differences were big. Uh, I don't know if the graphs are included here, uh, but if someone know. wants uh, how, how the moisture content and how water activity is changing through the time. And so, um, Trying at the origin is very important. Yeah, that's that was like uh, like what I saw on the on the on the chat. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. I think that trying on the on the producer side on on the patios, that's the most crucial part in terms of pre preserving the quality, and uh, that's something we as roasteries, we as coffee people, we have a little bit more resources, or we can gain resources to implement water activity matters at the farm level. Uh, especially nowadays, because producers are experimenting with those crazy um, anaerobic uh, carbonic maceration processing methods. And in many cases, then they don't measure the water activity. And in many cases, uh, the coffees are very high scoring on the first weeks. Uh, or first month, but after a few weeks, uh, the, the drop in points, and it was also proven in the Cafe Imports um, document about water activity, the lose, lost in points were, was really great, really big. So, yeah. And yeah, yeah don't and use hooks. <laughs> yeah, and Stuart, I thought, um, you know, again, kind of getting back to some practical applications of these things, and Chris as well, it's, it, it seems like that question is a perfect segue into, from this packaging standpoint, what are the practical aspects of it? Yeah. So start like, with. Uh, yeah, we probably all know this uh, this logo. Like, don't don't use hooks, or uh, sometimes you see it in different languages as well. But in essence, if you use the hooks, you're gonna break through the grain pro or ecotag or whatever, um, and ruin the hermetic environment. And um, I think this is a really interesting like thing that comes out of this research that in a way, if the best storage conditions are due to, but in a super controlled environment, 
if you rushed out to organize uh, all your coffees to come to you in Jude, well, that exposes you to a whole nother level of risk in, in terms of origin, um, because unless they're able to secure the same environment and temperature that Christoph's talking about from, you know, kind of the drying table or the patio to, to the ship and then on the ship and all of this stuff, then it just seems... Um, pretty pretty unlikely i did think like if if people do want to pursue this i would really i would really encourage them that actually you can buy jute and you can have stuff rebagged um, it's a service that i doubt many warehouses would be thrilled that i'm telling you that they do but most warehouses will rebag um, for instance uh, there were instances in my career where um, a handful of bags, you know, two or three bags would uh, arrive molded and uh, the coffee would get thrown away. But maybe, you know, if that was sat adjacent to another coffee, the jute bag will have got mold on it, but the hermetic uh, bag will have kept it safe. So, so the, the warehouse is able to swap out the coffees. So if you wanted to pursue this, I would uh, talk to your warehouse about possibly putting things in jute. The other option is, of course, to, to try and have sort of silos and I wonder if this could be a really um, more fruitful and easier way to achieve this would be to have uh, temperature controlled silos. And if you, you received your delivery of a certain coffee and you put it all into this silo, that is something that I don't know so much about, but I, I actually assume it's possibly easier and, and uh, makes more sense than rebagging all your coffee on arrival. But yeah, I did yeah. think that was, that was interesting. Um, yeah anyway. and and i and and you know as i'm thinking about packaging and things and looking at the video and chris like do you do you think that the results would have been any different had the coffee been packaged in larger larger quantities instead of like the small sealed bag if it was in like the full 60 kilo bags do you think there would have been any impact on the study or i think yes because um each time you take just 100 gram samples. So you open the grain pro bag, close it, open, close it. So uh, you disharmonize it and then seal it. So uh, yeah. that's why we decided to make it manually. We bought like uh, empty grain pros and cut it and, uh, and created like thousand plus uh, small grain pro bags just for this purpose. Uh, but for us, it was the, 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 the reason to, to be sure that like, the sample is straight from Grain Pro without any damage. Because the damage and this uh, picture we can see, that's super common. Uh, mm -hmm. In most cases, uh, we as, as roasteries, uh, we pay more uh, to be sure that our coffee was packed in Grain Pro or Ecotac or other foil. Um, bag, but in many cases the bags are like uh, broken. Even a small chip, in a, even a small scratch, can uh, it's like losing the quality, and 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 we pay for that. So we need to. Uh, I'm always when I cut, so I'm getting such coffees that that the bag inside is broken. I'm taking pictures and sending back to uh, to exporting company or importing company. Uh, to tell them that they, uh, let's check it, double check it, triple check it. If more people will be looking at this, hopefully uh, there will be less uh, cases of breaking the bags inside. Right, right. One thing that, that stands out to me in doing uh, more research for, for this talk was that I think it was in, um, there was a, a research study done in 2005, which I think really kicked off a lot of the work of uh, getting producers to, to use Grain Pro. But actually that, that research was quite focused on these uh, hermetic cocoons. And that's something that Grain Pro, I know as a business, um, still push. And, and it's something we don't, we don't necessarily see a lot. And I, haven't, I don't really see in uh, producing countries, I don't really see on the ground here. But the idea, instead of having um, individual 60 kg, 70 kg bags, uh, grain prode, but instead to have a lot or a container's worth um, cocooned. So the whole thing cocooned. Um, and, and even beyond that, there are even these cocoons that go into containers that reduce the air as well, which theoretically reduces uh, exposure to, to moisture and things like that. So thinking about the practical applications of uh, 
of this a step further for an exporter or an importer um, if you felt you could control your warehouse environment to these uh, capabilities and you wanted to have jute instead you could still have an effective grain pro just be on the whole lot instead of on the mm -hmm. uh, individual bag and yeah. I, I think that that is something that may be explored more in the future yeah, I think that's a great idea because also from just the practical standpoint of a roastery dealing, you know, with um, 20 tons of coffee that's packaged 60 kilos at a time in grain pro, that's a lot of grain pro to dispose of. And yeah, if I had a super sack and if we're, you know, I think what, what we're all sort of saying is it's important to really protect the coffee in transit. And that's where the grain pro comes in to play. But if we're finding that jute or some other storage condition might be just as practical once it arrives in the consuming country that those those either super sacks or those container liners could be a great solution yeah super sack it's like something to good like 100 kg or 1000 kg big bag it, you can like implement it in, yeah. yeah and then easily with some pneumatic pipes you can transfer the coffee from the warehouse right. into the roasting chamber yeah, so I like that there's solutions both for like the larger roasters that might be contracting the full the full container and also somebody that might be more accustomed to purchasing at the pallet by pallet level. Yeah. And 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 we've tossed around these words about moisture and water activity. And you know, these were measurements that Christoph was taking um, of the samples, but I think they are a little bit um, you know, I, I still think they're misunderstood even by coffee companies that have studied these things extensively. But I wonder, um, Stuart, since yeah, I know that Cafe Imports has done a lot of studying on this and has some pretty robust research, can you just comment a little bit on how they're different, why we might care about these things, and, and what types of um, storage conditions for both of you can impact that? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, to just do a brief kind of understanding i think most of us are quite aware of what moisture content is and, and as a concept it sounds incredibly straightforward how much water is in this as a percentage you know that that is pretty straightforward and it is um kind of ico guidance to to aim that all coffee be dried to between eight and twelve percent moisture content 12 i think is quite high in specialty terms you typically see most importers and exporters working on a tighter band than that maybe eight and a half to eleven and a half or nine to eleven uh, yeah water activity is is instead it's sort of like how much well so there's a lot of different ways you could describe it but it's like how much water is there in a, a certain good that is unbonded that is able to interact to pass in and out of the, the, the good, whether it's coffee or something else. And why this is significant is at, um, from a food science standpoint and a hygiene standpoint, um, most products aim above a zero, oh, so, oh, so it also needs to be explained, but water activity is measured between zero and one, um, with one being water and zero being nothing. Uh, nothing really contains no no water um, so but above about 0 0.6 you start to get much more yeast much more microbial action like long before we were worried about coffee quality in terms of flavor and profile there's been people making these measurements to make sure that their their bread doesn't go moldy within a day or so um, what is very different about them and, and uh, in our preparations for this talk, I mentioned this example, but for instance, if you think about dried fruit, dried fruit has a lot more uh, moisture than coffee, dried coffee. It has around 32% moisture. I looked into this around 30%, um, but the water activity of dried fruit is quite low. It's, uh, it's around where you'd hope coffee to be around 0 0.6. Um, I found that flour and rice actually has a higher water activity than um, coffee does. It's around 0 0.8, it's much higher. So it's quite interesting how, how you think of uh, water content as being like how much water there is. Water activity is a much more dynamic measurement. That said, um, yeah, from, from my time at Cafe Imports, um, 
I did gain a better understanding of this and they did some really great research which is still available online with 25,000 data points. Um, and there is a direct correlation between, between uh, moisture content and, and water activity. Um, originally when they started doing this, the study, the real question was, could we find that um, at a certain water activity, we could have stable coffee even with a higher moisture content because the experience in, uh, in the producing countries when, you, when you're buying coffee is often 12%, even 13% uh, moisture content coffees can taste incredible on the table, but they typically fade very quickly. In fact, they rarely last to, to um, import stage, they're, they're, they're gone. Um, so the excitement was really like, could we find out that a 12.5% moisture content coffee with a low water activity was stable enough that it could be imported. However, what the real findings were was that you just don't get this kind of correlation. Like what they, they mirror each other, they follow each other, higher moisture content goes along with higher water activity. Um, I think this is a super interesting measurement for, for the industry. I think we're still kind of grappling with with what it is um, but I, I think as well another thing from the report that really stands out to me is that water activity really is one measure at one point uh, so where I work now Osito, we, we take water measurement before we purchase any coffee water activity and moisture um, but ultimately if you bought a bag of coffee and then dunked it in some water or let's not be so extreme, you put it in a very humid environment, it could pick up a lot more moisture and the water activity can go up. It's not, it's not a fixed measurement. Um, just in the same way that water content, uh, moisture content is not necessarily fixed if the environment changes a lot. And that's kind of why Christoph's work is so interesting is because it focuses on the environment. Um, I think one thing I've also learned doing the research, it, which seems really obvious, but um, the higher temperature the air is, the more water it can persist, it can maintain. That doesn't mean that it fits 40 degrees in Texas, it's also raining. But uh, what it does mean is that tropical conditions are possible, whereas it's, it's quite rare you find very cold climates, which are also quite humid. I'm English, so I know it's possible. But, I, uh, but it, is, it is less common. Um, and so really there is a lot of risk in this area as coffee goes from a producing country that might be 30 degrees with high humidity, tropical conditions, and then goes into transport. And then that moisture condenses and falls on the coffee. These are all the kind of worries we have, I guess. Well, that's great. And um... Yeah, and I think water activity is so so interesting. I know I was just doing some some informal tests, nothing as organized as Christoph's work, but um, just by setting a bag of coffee like during a production day in a place where the sunlight can hit it for an hour during the day and heat up that bag a little bit, I can make the water activity jump. Um, so so it is an interesting measurement. Um, and of course, just to kind of bring it back to Cropster a little bit as we move into some final comments, um, you know, Cropster also, of course, is very concerned with these issues. And as part of the physical analysis of any of your coffees, there's an opportunity to record moisture, water activity, density as well, kind of these core physical measurements of, of your coffees so that you're able to, to watch them over time. And you know, really, I think this um, this discussion of water activity, and we've kind of been talking about you know moisture and these chemical analyses and these sensory analyses that um, that Chris has been doing. Like, I'm curious, like, what what does this practically mean for green coffee in your business? Because you've taken on this major research project, but you're also a business. So, just some practical takeaways. Uh, in terms of practical stuff um, and costs involved with this uh, whole uh, experience, uh, currently our main warehouse is set to 13 degrees Celsius plus. And with this system we have now, it's the most um, efficient in terms of costs. 
So going lower to 10 degrees Celsius will uh, increase a lot of the cost of energy we are consuming, the machines are consuming to provide uh, such low temperature. Um, just to bring you an idea, um, the cost per month of just power we are using uh, is around $500. Uh, so that's the cost of uh, power used by the machines to preserve the temperature 24 hours a day. Um, the setup uh, was way, way more uh, expensive. Uh, let's say a good uh, 15 kg uh, roaster, that's the price of such warehouse um, to build from the scratch because we made it from the scratch. Um, and. Um, the, it depends everything on how much you coffee roast. So, for example, if we aim to 6,000, 7,000 kg per month, uh, it's below 10 cents per kg, uh, the cost of storage. But looking at the quality of the bean and looking on the stuff that we can preserve the quality for longer time, uh, it's worth it. Uh, to, yeah, and I, to and keep I think that you know, way. when you think about that, that sort of seven to nine cents per kg in energy yeah. cost added to the cost. I mean, you could easily or potentially recoup that in saved labor because of maybe some efficiency of having more coffee closer by. Or, I mean, I think we could all probably find a way to save, you know, yeah. five cents a kilo okay. just in packaging. So, <laughs> yeah, that's um, the plastic that's, we use. For breaking it down that way. Um, and this this kind of facility is this like the kind of thing where I would just call like a restaurant company that like builds refrigeration systems for large restaurants or like what's the what's really the nuts yeah. and bolts of getting something like this? Uh, the company we work with uh, is implementing big uh, fridges for ice cream factories. Okay. Uh, so they know how to build such uh, such uh, places the whole uh, the whole system which is running the whole warehouse is four meter long one and a half meter high and the wide is like 1.2 meter okay. uh, that's that's the system for cleaning the water to keeping the uh, cleaning the, the air ionized air and maintain it and as you can see, uh, the warehouse at this picture is right next to the roaster. Uh, currently, uh, each batch, so we use uh, brut uh, jars now with the 35 kilo degree roaster. Currently, all production is prepared inside the warehouse, inside the room. Uh, we don't open and close the doors to like, I don't know, uh, prepare 35 kg of, of Brazilian coffee. Uh, if we have scheduled 20, 22, 18 batches per day, uh, in the morning, uh, one person is preparing all the batches inside the warehouse. Mm -hmm. And then we just drive from like with a small trolley from the warehouse with the, with the jars with green coffee uh, next to the machine. Uh, that we knew that uh, we don't lose a lot of energy uh, in the meantime, because like, for example, preparing uh, 20, like 22 batches is around one hour, let's say. Mm -hmm. So if you open and close one hour if outside today, we have 30 degrees Celsius, uh, you lose a lot of energy and a lot of money uh, because the whole system need to work 100% uh, on to maintain the stability. And have you found that with this protocol, it, um, it's easier to be more consistent, like batch to batch and like your between batch protocols are more consistent? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, it's very crucial, uh, especially in countries like in Poland that in the mornings we have like in the springtime we, or beginning of summer, we can have 10 degrees Celsius and later on 30 degrees Celsius. Uh, so keeping the coffee stable all the time, uh, the roaster uh, don't need to be as much stressed uh, to set up the charge temperature, to set up the power for the beginning of the roast 
uh, to hit the turning point and to hit the, the line, to hit the profile. Uh, mm -hmm. Because each time the coffee which goes into the loader and into the roasting chamber, it's like same temperature, same uh, mm -hmm. degree of temperature. Yeah, great. I mean, so just it's like I love the, the benefits just keep unfolding as we peel peel through this. Um, and I think yeah, we're we're getting to the, the top of the hour and and wrapping up here. But um, we saw the in the photo the ambient sensor that Chris um, is using. And I just wanted to share what some of that readout looks like from these sensors that we provide that can track temperature, humidity, and air pressure in a facility. So this is something that anybody can implement right away that's just captured directly in your Cropster account. Um, these happen to be readouts from a sensor that's just in the Cropster office in Austria. So it's not really a roasting facility, but it does show you how this data can be plotted over time and how you can set various target ranges. And in our case, our temperature is well out of target, going from 22 to 25 degrees. Um, but a tool that I think it'll be interesting, Chris, to see um, to see this data as you collect more of it with your own ambient sensors in your roastery. Um, I'm keen to to loop back around and talk about that. Um, and I, I think that we covered a ton of ground here today. These are just some, as I was, was thinking about this topic, um, I just wanted to capture some sort of key takeaways from my perspective. You know, Chris and Stuart might disagree. Um, I also have the link here to the Research Square article, which we can, um, which we can also, you know, this is being recorded, so we can make sure that this is along with the recording when we post it. But green coffee storage, 10 degrees is the most stable. Um, and even after 12 months, that was kind of the key but it may be um, a little bit impractical to, to maintain coffee at that temperature. As Chris has said, he's storing it at, did you say 15 degrees is where you've set your warehouse now? Uh, 13, one, three. 13, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that nice surprise about Jute versus Grain Pro, um, but being mindful that conditions during transport um, still probably warrant Grain Pro or, or Ecotact or some sort of a protective liner. And then practically it's there's, you know, it's important just to know your green coffee, you know, monitor and logging and understanding your environmental conditions as well. And and as as Chris has talked about, this balance of the cost versus the benefits, which at the end of the day, when you kind of run the numbers, the costs on a like per kilo basis can be quite low. Um, anything to add, guys? Let's see it for the question. <laughs> yeah, let's see. We if have, there are um, any. A little time for Q&A here. So if, if anybody has some questions, I know um, one of our attendees did ask, how was the moisture content measured for the samples? Um, and that specific device was that was measured at your roastery, was it also measured at the, um, at the lab? Questions about and sample that, sizes, because many require mm -hmm you know, a 250 gram or larger sample size. So just, just some comments about that protocol. Uh, in terms of uh, humidity, uh, moisture content and uh, water activity. Uh, so we prepared uh, um, one room where I'm sitting now uh, to with uh, air condition to set for 20 degrees Celsius that each time the samples were measured in the same ambient temperature. And for moisture content and density, uh, we were using Sinar Bean Pro 6070. And for water activity, we were using uh, Rotronic Hydropalm. Palm, hydro palm. Uh, but the most important case was that each sample, no, no matter if it was like spring, summer, autumn or winter, we prepared a like, small room where I'm sitting now with air condition to be sure that every time the measurements are taken with the same uh, ambient or environmental temperature. Yeah, thank you. And the samples were 100, uh, 100 grams in terms of the small grain pros. So 100 grams of green and 100 grams of 
roasted cookie. Okay, great. And any other questions from folks, from any of our attendees or questions from Chris to Stuart or Stuart to Chris before we, we bid everybody farewell for our webinar? I guess not. I guess that that, that <laughs> silence tells us that we've covered a lot of ground. Um, you're welcome to reach out to us at Cropster and in the chat. Um, I appreciate the questions that were coming through. Tim, especially as an attendee, you had a lot of great questions. I appreciate that. And um, this it has been recorded, so we will be posting it um, as soon as we're able to turn that around. But. Thanks so much to our esteemed panelists. It's great to be um, working in an industry with folks pursuing such, such interesting research and willing to take, take their time, not just focusing on their business, but pursuing work that I think is valuable to all of us. So thank you. Chris, thank you Pressure for that. Is and, mine. and Stuart, you as well. Thank you very much.